fantastic. Oh, and Claire has also just popped in the chat that she's also going to post it on the HDYO's uh, social media post as well. So that will be amazing. Thank you, Kelly, again. No worries. Thank you. That's great. That's okay. So um, to start off the next section, so I'm actually going to be presenting. Uh, so I, hi, just again, I'm Angela from Brisbane in Australia. I'm based in Queensland. And uh, I'm actually going to be speaking about my Huntington's journey, but more importantly, my recent IVF with PDT journey that I've completed. Um, so I have a presentation that I have organized. So I'm going to get this loaded shortly. Sorry to bear with me one second. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to be doing a bit of an introduction. Uh, before I go through anything though, I do just want to let people know that there are medical images and then also technically medical procedures shown. Um, so just make sure that viewer discretion is advised. Um, of course, everything today is personal. So it's all based on my particular experience. Um, obviously, I'm not a medical professional. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. And then um, in terms of the fertility experience with IVF, uh, of course, that's also based on my particular uh, journey as well. Um, and I guess, you know, everyone has their own unique individual journey. So keep that in mind. So a little bit about my history with Huntington's. So my Huntington's history actually started with my great grandfather. Uh, however, he actually passed away before any symptoms arose. Um, and so he wasn't actually confirmed, but we believe that's how the Huntington's gene entered my family tree. Uh, now, my grandfather's brother was actually the first person in my family tree to be uh, symptomatic. So he had a lot of mental health illness issues um, for a quite a number of years. And it was unknown in the family of what it was until my granddad's sister, Auntie Ruth, was uh, genetically tested for Huntington's disease. And this is a photo up here of my mum. And this is my Auntie Ruth. This is my granddad and myself as a baby. Um, shortly after Auntie Ruth uh, became positive for HD, we then learned that it was a genetic illness. And so, of course, we determined that uh, potentially my granddad was also going to be at risk. Um, he wasn't genetically tested, though, because he actually became symptomatic uh, shortly after my Auntie Ruth did. Um, pretty much my grandma was the main caregiver for my grandfather for many, many years. Um, you know, I was a young child and I just saw him as this old man. I didn't actually realize that it was Huntington's disease. Um, you know, I was only about four or five and I just thought he walked funny. You know, I just thought that he was old and that's why he was acting that way. Um, pretty much one day my parents sat me down and they said, no, he's actually different than most people. Uh, he's actually, you know, the funny arm movements that he makes, that's actually uncontrollable. He can't control that. and that is what really first allowed me to understand what Huntington's was. As years went by, of course, my grandfather um, symptoms just became worse. So my family actually moved him into a nursing home where he uh, became quite severe in his late, um, late stages of HD and he passed away a couple of years after moving into the nursing home. Uh, when my grandfather passed away, um, my mum actually became symptomatic, I guess just, you know, dealing with the grief. Um, it was uh, about the same time. So it was a lot all at once for our family. Um, and yeah, so mum never actually was genetically tested, uh, but she did attend um, 
a specialist appointment and the specialist completed a mental and physical examination with my mum where they confirmed that she had HD even though she wasn't tested. So for my mum's Huntington's journey, um, she was just, you know, first symptomatic when I was in primary school. So I was still quite young. I was only about 10 or 11 when she first became symptomatic. Uh, when she did become symptomatic, she had a really long struggle with depression straightly afterwards. Um, she had a couple of cares, um, but the big thing that wasn't fantastic for my mum is when she had to give up her license so pretty much she didn't have the same responsiveness that you need for driving and basically with that she had to lose her license uh, after that she had to basically live semi-independently uh, she needed help preparing meals um, needed help cleaning her unit um, so it was uh, a couple of years but it was a bit of a struggle what ended up happening though over the time as her symptoms progressed is then she started having difficult walking. Um, so what we did is at first we used uh, like a wheelie walker and that was helpful. Um, we didn't really find a walking cane was that great. Um, we used like sippy cups or cups with straws so she could drink properly and eat her meals. Um, but eventually got to the point where she was just losing too much weight um, and she became very fragile and thin. Uh, so pretty much in a couple of months, she lost almost 15 kilos um, and it was a really big struggle. But what we ended up doing is reaching out to our local HD association here in Queensland. Um, and we actually got a couple of tips from them on some different ways we could improve mum's weight. Uh, so she started having things like milkshakes, gravy, um, and even ice cream. Like, you know, some things that are easy for her to still eat, but had the most calories. And one thing that also didn't help is that she loved her Milo ice cream. <laughs> Um, I guess what happened though is as years progressed, of course, what happened is we ended up moving her into a nursing home. Um, and basically, as soon as she moved into the nursing home, she was basically bound to a bed or a wheelchair. Uh, so we ended up moving her quite late into her late stages. Um, but what was really great is when we did move her into the nursing home, it was a bit relieving for myself and my family as we didn't have the, you know, the extra care and, you know, that responsibility as well. It gave us a little bit of relief. Um, I was working part-time plus also studying full-time at the same time as well. So it was a little bit difficult. Um, one thing that I guess happens at the late stages of HD is sometimes their mind can get a little bit clouded. Um, so some days, you know, she struggled to speak or didn't speak at all. And then some days she was, you know, as bright as a light. And um, basically, if it was one of those days, we would play Scrabble, which was, you know, one of her favourite things. Uh, so, you know, Scrabble, crossword, puzzles. Uh, she was a big word person. So <laughs> we tried to make the most of her good days. Um, and then eventually it got to the late stages and uh, she basically had trouble keeping down any food or water at all. Um, and my mum passed away in August of 2019. So for genetic testing, so I wanted to complete the journey and I knew this pretty much since I was a young girl. Um, so especially through my uh, teenage years, I made the decision to get tested. Now, a big thing to keep in mind is if you are thinking of getting tested, please reach out to your genetic counsellor, your local HD support system. Um, please also make sure like, you know, you have family or friends, like even if it's just one person that you can reach out to who can help you support uh, during this journey. Now, something to keep in mind as well is that people need to have the mental and emotional maturity for understanding the testing journey itself, but also what comes afterwards. So for example, you know, people need to have um, a, a bit of an idea of once they find out that result, they need to have an idea of how to um, cope with that result and also how to move forward. 
For myself personally, I mainly wanted clarity for future career goals and future study. So as I mentioned, I was doing university study at the time and I was thinking of potentially doing further study as well. Uh, but if I was to test positive, I wasn't quite sure if it was going to be worth it. Um, so I kind of did a bit of a questionnaire, kind of like a pros and con list to see if it would really be worth it. Um, I guess a couple of things that I was thinking is uh, if I was to test positive, then I may have to retire earlier. Uh, you know, I may have to retire at 40, 45, rather than some people who could work until their 60s or 70s. Um, so what this is obviously going to affect is the savings I would need for retirement. Um, plus also HD has its extra cost as well. So I was thinking both short and long-term goals. Plus, of course, another reason I wanted to be tested is because I knew that if I was positive, I wanted HD to stop with me. So I basically knew that if I was to have any children, I wanted to have all of the options that would only result in a HD free baby. So for my particular journey, it started with a doctor's appointment. So I went and saw my local GP here in Australia, spoke to him, advised him that my mum had Huntington's and that I have Huntington's in my family tree. And what he did is he wrote a referral to Genetic Health Queensland, which is my local government authority for genetics. Uh, after that, I spoke to a genetic counsellor for quite a couple of hours. Um, we broke it up over a couple of calls though, uh, but we spoke about many things. Uh, we spoke about my history, um, you know, my granddad, myself, uh, my mum, and, you know, even the care requirements I had as a caregiver as well. Um, he gave me a bit of an overview of what would be involved, how long it would take, and some of the necessary requirements, such as seeing a psychologist. And one of the reasons why seeing a psychologist is important is because they need to help prepare you for your results. Whether if it's negative, they may need to help you prepare for things such as survivor's guilt. Um, if it's potentially positive, um, then I knew a big thing that I was going to struggle with was telling my mum my genetic, uh, my genetic positive uh, result without feeling like a burden. So once we established the connection through my family tree, my uh, family ended up getting connected all the way back to my grand aunt Ruth from the 1990s. Um, once that connection was made, I had about four sessions with my psychologist in preparation spread over a couple of months. Uh, and then once they determined that I was ready, I then had a blood test that was completed at my local hospital. One of the things for my personal genetic testing journey is that I made sure that I was in um, a bit of a break from my university life. I made sure there was no busy commitments or examinations that I had. I wanted a bit of flexibility in my life at that particular time. So for preparing for the genetic uh, result day, I made sure that uh, a couple of days afterwards I could do whatever I want, I had flexibility. I made sure that the people close to me as well were also available. So if I needed them for support, they were there available as well. Uh, another tip that I did is also planned uh, a bit of a break. Um, so I took my dog to the beach. Um, I had a bit you know, of a holiday um, and I guess that just helped processing um, if it was going to be positive or negative. Uh, but I ended up testing gene positive in 2017 when I was 20. Um, and my dad and my boyfriend, later to become my husband, uh, attended the appointment with me. Now, coping with your result is something that is challenging in itself. Um, so as I mentioned, definitely plan a time where you have no commitments. Um, if, for example, you had to attend work the next day, but you tested positive, you know, you're not going to be in the right headspace. You may still be confused. Um, for example, myself, I actually went into major shock uh, that afternoon after I uh, found out my result and ended up back in hospital. Um, so yeah, definitely having some flexibility in your life is key. 
Uh, one thing that also helped me a lot was staying in contact with my psychologist. Um, so even still to date, uh, like five years later, I'm still in contact with her. Um, and I guess now it's to the point where we've developed our own personal relationship. Uh, she knows, you know, how I went with my mum when I was just a caregiver as a teenager through my testing process and forward as well. So it's really nice to have that ongoing relationship. But it's also just having that trust as well. Like, you know, someone who's outside of the family, like for myself, I didn't want to be a burden. Um, so, you know, just having that person that I could speak to, um, I always found that improved my mental health so much. Um, of course, though, after I did test positive, I did go into a bit of uh, depression. Uh, you know, I had anxiety quite severe for a couple of years afterwards. Um, and I guess sometimes, you know, keeping up with your daily routine, um, try and do three things that you love like per week or per month, like for example, I would go to the beach, read my favorite book series, you know, watch a movie, do something for yourself every once in a while, you know, even if it's just, you know, taking some time away from the family or disconnecting from social media, it definitely helps. Another thing as well is that um, I would recommend to buy yourself a gift if, you know, you're positive or negative. Um, so for myself, my boyfriend actually purchased uh, my dog, so Sadie, uh, and uh, that was pretty much my gift. So for my husband and myself, so my husband and I had been dating for around a year and a half when I tested positive. So we met at university actually in 2015, a couple of years before I tested. And as I mentioned, we adopted our Labrador Sadie after I tested positive. I guess what happened with Sadie as well is, um, well, one, I'm a big dog person, <laughs> but two, uh, it almost gave me like some extra responsibility as well each day. Like, you know, I would have to play with her, take her for a walk. Um, plus, you know, with those puppy eyes and puppy ears, they can give you it also helps as well. Um, but I guess I did confine in her a lot as well after I tested positive. Sometimes I would just cuddle up to her and just speak to her, even if it wasn't HD related, just, you know, kind of have someone there to support you. And it was really amazing just to, you know, make sure I wasn't feeling like a burden for my family. For myself and my husband though, so, uh, you know, when we met, my mum was already well into her symptoms. Uh, so she was probably in her middle stages at this point in time where she was living semi-independently. It was a little bit difficult how to introduce Huntington's to your partner in a relationship. And I do get this asked quite a lot. For myself personally, um, it was a little bit lucky because my husband had experience with a parent being sick. Um, so he kind of really supported me through this period in time. You know, he would reach out to me. He would understand if I was having a bad day. You know, he sometimes knew if I needed someone to cheer me up as well. And, you know, he was really there to support me, which was fantastic. Uh, about a couple of years later, we had a bit of a discussion on what our future relationship would be. So at this point, we'd been dating for maybe two, two and a half years. And of course, we wanted to, you know, talk about, you know, where are we going to have kids? Um, you know, what was our future going to be like as a couple and also as a, like, you know, our own individual? Now, of course, when the topic of children came up, as I said, as a teenager, I already knew that I didn't want HD to be passed down if I was positive, which I was. So basically I knew we only had a couple of options. Having that discussion with my husband was really essential. And what I loved was that we had a lot of open and honest communication. Um, and I definitely think that's key in the relationship. Uh, we were engaged though in uh, April of 2019 after we moved to Brisbane. Uh, so originally my hometown is Rockhampton in central Queensland. And then we were married in September of uh, 2020. And then in early 2021 is when we started our IVF journey. Now, of course, there are different options for having kids though. So even though I knew I wanted the HD to stop with me from since I was a young girl, there's so many different options there available now. 
you can have kids naturally, you can adopt kids, foster them. Uh, you can even have like egg and sperm donation as well. So they don't have to be your biological children, but you can still carry them and raise them. Um, you can have the option of not having any children at all. That's totally fine. Um, you can have my favorite one, which is becoming a dog mum. <laughs> I did really consider this at some point in time, you know, do I not just have any children and just adopt five dogs and live on a big farm with them? You know, it does happen and it's okay, but it's okay to know that there's so many options. Now, of course, the two that I did consider though was IVF with PGT. And then the other option as well was prenatal genetic testing. So I guess why I opted for IVF PGT though is that I knew I wanted the HG to stop and it does have probably the most success rate um, with the test being accurate. So for PGT, it's about 98 to 99%. It's pretty, good in Australia. Um, in different countries around the world, I'm not quite sure on the statistics, but I do believe it's very similar as well. The main reason why I opted for PGT though is that I never wanted to do prenatal genetic testing. So after I did quite a bit of research online, I found out that you actually become pregnant naturally and then they test the baby when they're 12 weeks old or when you're 12 weeks pregnant. And when they actually do the testing, there is an increased chance that you can have a miscarry. Now it's not a significant increase, but it's still an increased chance. And basically, I guess the thing is, is if they do the prenatic, the prenatal genetic testing, and then it comes back that the baby would be positive, my husband and I never wanted to be in that position where we would have to make a decision on what we would do moving forward and if we would have the child or not. So because of that, my husband and I decided to start our IVF with PGT journey. Now, when we started the journey, we got a doctor referral, saw our fertility specialist. When I spoke to my doctor about starting our IVF journey, one thing that I wanted to do is ensure that I had a doctor who had kind of be familiar with the PGT process, but maybe even had a Huntington's patients in the past, because then they kind of had a bit of an understanding of the process and what we were going through. So for the PGT, in order for it to work, we need to do a thing called a genetic workup. There's a couple of different names for it. Um, and basically what that means is there's quite a few consent forms you've got to do, um, you know, just understanding what is involved, the risk in it. Um, you have a consultant with a nurse, both in the fertility specialist group and also in the genetics department themselves. And they are really supportive through the genetic workup stage. Now, my husband and I both completed our blood test for the genetic workup to start. And basically what that means is they test our blood. So for example, for myself as a female, they test my AMH, which basically, you know, has a bit of a rough idea of how my hormone levels are going and make sure there's no infertility issues that I'm unaware of. One thing with my personal journey though, is that because my mum was already, she had already passed away, we actually had to use my dad's DNA to highlight my Huntington's gene. So because we never had a copy of my mum's DNA still available, and that was liable for them to use and test, we actually had to complete it differently. So what happened is they compared my blood to my dad's blood, knowing the other segments of my DNA would belong to my mum. So that's how they actually tested for the Huntington's to find the particular gene so they can make the test to determine if my embryos would carry the, PG, the HD gene or not. My dad did originally just complete a saliva test, which you can do just like, you know, from 23andMe, I believe, um, but it ended up not being enough and they had to complete a blood test to make it a little bit easier. One of the things I didn't expect with the PGT workup was actually getting 
official evidence, I guess, of my family history and medical documents. Um, so I had to reach out to Queensland Health on multiple occasions, um, get records from the 1990s, which is a little bit difficult being paper copies. Um, and we had to find uh, the genetic health from my great aunt Ruth, and then also, you know, confirming it connected through my HD through my granddad, then my mum, and then myself. Um, so that process was a little bit long, um, but it probably took about a month. Once they had the paperwork though, we paid the bill and then they officially started the process. The process itself probably actually took about two and a half months. So it is a little bit of time consuming for not only PGT, but IVF in general. But of course, in the end, they were able to confirm that they were able to highlight the particular H gene gene in my blood. Now, how IVF works, so it happens in quite a few stages. So the first stage is when you begin your cycle. So on day one of your period, you will sometimes meet with your doctor to have a scan just to see how everything is going. You'll have quite a few appointments with them. Um, you can generally expect anywhere between three, four appointments, um, you know, multiple scans, multiple blood tests um, throughout the journey. So on normally day two or three, uh, you'll start your IVF injections. Now for the first couple of days, you normally just have an injection in the meat, in the the um, in your stomach in the morning. Uh, the next couple of days, normally about day seven to 13, you'll also have an injection in the evening. So two needles a day. Then what will happen is 36 hours before your egg collection, you will actually have what's called a trigger shot, which is quite a series of needles. Um, you can also have oral medication as well. Uh, so, you know, you can sometimes have anywhere between four to six needles uh, within a couple of hours of each other. But after that, that's all the medication you need to do until we have the IVF egg collection. So basically what the IVF egg collection is, is a day procedure where you will actually go to a specialist hospital, normally for IVF patients. And it's really similar. Um, it's very quick, actually. I was quite surprised in my first round. Uh, so it's probably only about 30 to 40 minutes, depending on the amount of eggs that you have to collect. Um, and basically um, they uh, put you to sleep most of the time, uh, and then you wake up and the nurses look after you for a couple of hours. Now, after the egg collection, uh, what happens is uh, the egg and the sperm will then be fertilized in preparation to create an embryo. Once they've been fertilized, basically one can happen is genetic testing. There is a bit of a process though, after it becomes fertilized and becomes an embryo. So what can happen is, uh, for example, you can have so many eggs collected, then out of your eggs collected, you can have so many uh, matured, which means they can actually fertilize those eggs. Sometimes not all of your eggs are guaranteed to be able to be fertilized. Then sometimes the numbers can drop again with the ones that were actually successful in being fertilized. Then you normally have about a day three update, which is pretty much confirming, uh, you know, that they've been able to grow. So there's different stages of the embryos. And then day five is when they become a blastocyst. Uh, so basically this means that they can be uh, frozen. A couple of cells are actually taken from the embryo for the genetic testing. And then the rest of the embryo is actually frozen. Once they've been sent for genetic testing, um, for myself, it only took around two, two and a half weeks for the genetic testing results to actually come back. Um, and for myself, I'll talk about my results shortly. Um, but once you do have an embryo that can be used for transfer, you have a pr quick procedure, probably only about 10 minutes, uh, where they actually insert the embryo back into yourself. Then after the embryo transfer, you generally have what's known as a two week wait. Uh, sometimes it's not two weeks exactly, sometimes it's a week and a half. Uh, and then they can form uh, a blood test to confirm if you are pregnant or not. 
So for myself, I actually completed two IVF egg collection rounds. Uh, so the first round I completed in July 2021. Now I had 20 eggs collected originally. And then as I mentioned, only 11 mature. So that were actually able to be fertilized. And then out of 11, it actually dropped down to only three fully fertilized and then three were partly fertilized. And so those numbers dropped and they dropped fast. Now, my mental health during that time is not the best and I'll elaborate on that more shortly. Uh, but in our first IVF collection round, uh, we actually didn't even have any that made it to the blastocyst rounds, meaning that we never even had any that were able to be genetically tested. My second round was in November 2021, uh, which was significantly improved. So we had 25 collected, 22 mature, 17 fertilized, and six that were able to be genetically tested. And then out of the six that were genetically tested, we had three that came back HD free, and then they were frozen. So as I mentioned, IVF and mental health is probably one of the biggest things to be aware of. IVF is tough. Um, I'm not going to lie. It's one of the difficult experiences that you'll probably have in your life. It is a process and it takes time. You need to have patience. So as I mentioned for myself, I started in early 2021. I had two IVF collections last year. Um, and, you know, sometimes it can take, you know, a long journey and it can be a couple of months apart every time. The IVF hormones also don't help. So when I completed my first round, my body wasn't used to the hormones, um, you know, the hormone injections. I would have mood swings. Um, I would have random parts in the day where I'll just cry for like half an hour for no reason at all. Um, I still remember so clearly uh, just before my uh, egg collection for my first round, uh, I saw a video on Facebook of um, this dog that missed its best friend uh, that you know, another dog had passed away and I just sat there sobbing for like 40 minutes wondering why am I crying so much but it was just the emotion and you know the challenges of having all those extra IVF injections that increase those hormones. Another big thing with IVF as well and especially for your mental health is Going through the journey, it can be difficult seeing your friends have, you know, pregnancy announcements and having their own children. And, you know, it's hard being like, oh, you know, I just wish that was me kind of thing. It's, it's everyone going through infertility or going through IVF and almost reaching out to people who have a platform of IVF is what really helped me during that period. Um, so I reached out to multiple people on Facebook, Instagram, and that really helped. Now, of course, because of the injections, it can also cause arguments with your relationships as well. Um, not only your partner, but your family and friends. Um, you know, sometimes you can just be so heated in the moment, um, full of those emotions and, you know, just go on a rage. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, you can get uh, quite a bit of uh, stress as well with IVF. Um, not only with it being a long process in general, but just being so complex. Another thing is watching those numbers drop so fast sometimes is a real challenge to not get wrapped up in the numbers. And I do find a lot of patients who do complete IVF struggle with that also. And I guess the thing is, just remember, you're not alone. There's so many people. I was so many surprised on how many of my actual friends and family had gone through IVF without me knowing. I was still really shocked when like, you know, I was open and honest and I posted on my own platform that I'm going through IVF and, you know, so many people privately messaged me and that was really wonderful to see. Now, of course, if you do complete an embryo transfer, you do need to keep in mind that something that can happen is a miscarriage and also a negative pregnancy test. There's always going to be that risk there and just keep in mind, be nice to your mental health and I guess one thing that I spoke a lot with my psychologist about is it's also okay to grieve and it's okay to grieve even about like an embryo loss or like you know the numbers decreasing and you know just prepare yourself for it you know be okay if it's a bad result. 
Now, a big thing is how much does it cost? <laughs> it costs a lot of money. Um, the main thing for IVF in Australia, though, is it changes between each state and also each fertility group. Um, you can also require additional services as well, which adds on to the cost, for example, like IS, uh, ICIS, um, and then you can also have PGT on top. Um, so it can be a bit. Normally in Australia, though, you would actually have to pay up front about 14000 per egg collection round. Uh, from that 14,000, Medicare normally refund you about 6,000. So for those who don't know, Medicare is the uh, health government fund uh, in here in Australia. And basically the way they work is uh, they may pay a portion of your expense. Now for the PGT workup, uh, that was around 1,700 for myself. Uh, and then for the IVF transfer, it was 4,500 and I got around 1,800 back. One thing that I was really surprised with is private health insurance doesn't help at all. So I thought that with having private health insurance with IVF, it would make a huge difference in terms of my cost, uh, but it didn't. So pretty much with private health insurance, you have to have top cover known as gold. And with that level of cover, you only actually get about maybe 1000 to 1500 extra back per egg collection. So it's not really that much, but the premiums are really high for that top cover. Now, one of the huge things that I really am passionate about and really happy that it's finally been introduced is the PGT Medicare rebate that's now been announced in Australia. Um, so in May of 2021, it was announced as part of the federal budget in Australia that there's going to be PGT with IVF rebates on the genetic testing per embryo. So for Normally IVF, it's about uh, $700 per embryo that you want to get genetically tested. So for example, uh, myself, I had six to be genetically tested in my second round. Um, so that's, you know, 4,200. Most people do have a cap though. So they normally cap it around four or 5,000. So you generally don't pay more than that. And we are really fortunate where Huntington's is actually one of the illnesses that is eligible, um, but there is a particular criteria that needs to be followed. So you need to have, you know, um, a blood test form, uh, you need to have either the identified gene or is at risk of the gene. Um, and then you need to have, uh, for example, where there's no curable uh, treatment currently. So thank you so much, everyone. I do really appreciate it. I have got my Instagram down the bottom there as well, where I do share a lot of my journey, uh, both for Huntington's and IVF. And a little update as well is um, a couple of weeks ago, I actually completed my first embryo transfer. And I thought I'd share some amazing news with you guys that I just found out on Wednesday that my transfer has so far been successful. It is still very early days though. Um, I'm only five weeks yesterday, so it's very early days, but um, I just thought I'd share that all with you as a bit of an update. Cool, awesome, Angela. That is great news. What a, what a great way to finish the presentation. And um, but hey, we've just got a few questions if that's okay. So that's okay. One... I see a couple of them. <laughs> cool, so awesome. um I'll go through Haley's question. Um so I'm going through the QA first. Um so Haley, I'm currently 25. I turned 25 in uh January, so I've already had my birthday this year. Uh, so it's been five years since I was tested positive. Um, and there was another question, which is what is AMH? So it's basically a test in your blood where they can measure your hormone levels. Basically what it measures is to make sure there's no infertility. So it basically measures basically the chance of you falling pregnant. So if it's really low, that means you have a really low chance of falling pregnant. Or if it's really high, sometimes that can lead to other infertility issues. So they like it to be in, of course, the normal range. Um, sometimes if you have been on birth control as well, your AMH won't actually be reflected correctly. Um, so that was something that I found out. I'm just reading a couple of questions here. Uh, another one from Haley is, uh, 
if I went to a different clinic, no, I didn't. So both rounds were actually through the same clinic. Um, one thing that I guess for myself, if I can pass on, not as advice, but just from my experience is there was a large difference between my two rounds. We basically can't confirm, but we do believe the main difference is actually due to my mental health. So leading up to my first round, I had no idea what was expected. Um, I didn't really have much of an explanation from people on what the process was. So my anxiety and stress levels were through the roof. Um, I had only just got a promotion at work. So that was also stressful in my personal life. Um, in my second round though, we actually had a week holiday before my collection. Um, so basically we saw our family, we just relaxed on the beach. Um, we basically had, like my husband and I had our own time and that completely changed my mental health. You know, I was happy, I was excited. I, I knew the process, so I wasn't as anxious. So I definitely think for myself, having that mental health was probably the big key thing that made my second round so much more successful. Um, and yes, Haley. so in terms of funding, yes. Uh, so in total at the moment, uh, we've probably spent about 16,000 in total out of our own pockets for the IVF with PGT. Um, there's also some more costs still that I need to pay. Um, so probably in total, we're probably gonna be looking at about 20,000 out of pocket. Um, in some countries, they do have it where it can be partly funded, fully funded, um, for example, I think in the UK, it's funded for one round only, um, where it's not that in Australia, it's just basically you pay for the cost. And then if you're eligible for Medicare, Medicare will rebate, um, rebate you the difference. Okay, the chat is blowing up. I'm just going to have a look here for you guys. Thank you for all the messages, though. Leanne, would you mind helping me out go through these messages? Yeah, you're all good. And all the questions were in the question and answer section. Uh, there was there was just one other one though. Um, Haley would just like to know, what did you do for self-care on your not so good days? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one actually. Like not even just through the testing for HD, but also the IVF ones. And like, I'm not going to lie, like, you know, my partner and I had arguments some days, you know, just because I wasn't feeling it. Um, I got to the point where in my first round, when I found out that I had zero, not even make it to the genetic stage, that really hit me hard. Um, like, you know, I had struggles, you know, sometimes I was questioning my judgment, being like, is it worth doing it? Like, you know, we just spent all this money. Like, I think at that point we'd spent like $7,000 and I was like, is it really worth doing IVF? It's costing us so much money. And, you know, the first round was completely different. It was so bad. Um, so, you know, it is definitely something that is quite difficult to deal with mentally. Um, I guess at that point, I booked a lot more of sessions with my psychologist. So I kind of have my own rhythm mentally if I'm having those bad days on how to deal with it. Um, as I mentioned, basically my dog Sadie, uh, pretty much even still to today, I still confine in her. Um, but I kind of do like, you know, those three things a week or three things a month. Um, so I love going for a walk on the beach. I find the beach so calming, um, you know, taking the dog for a run, you know, being in nature, exercising, you know, having that thing there, but also being open and honest and sharing my platform, being an advocate and a voice as well. It also helps. Um, and, you know, with my Instagram, uh, so I've also like followed so many fertility pages as well as Huntington's as well. And there's so many people uh, that are in similar situations and, you know, just having people you can talk to, you know, it, it's really helpful. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Angela. I think that's all the questions that we've, we've had through. So thank you for answering those. And um, thank you so much for an awesome presentation. Um, quite a few people, people come through saying how inspiring that was. 
um, but also hugely insightful um, for other people that will be going through this journey as well. So thank you for your vulnerability. And um, yeah, just thank you for the way that you presented it. It was awesome. That's okay. Thank you, everyone. I'll stick around for a little while in case anyone has any more questions. <laughs>